Good morning. My name is Jim Putnam with Farm Credit East. Uh, welcome to our Dairy Policy and Farm Bill uh, webinar this morning. Uh, we greatly value you taking a few uh, minutes out of your uh, valuable time to participate with us this morning. Um, just a, a brief uh, plug for our Knowledge Exchange Program. Uh, we try to produce uh, webinars and other types of information uh, that are helpful uh, to our farm producers here in the Northeast uh, community on uh, topics that are of interest to you. Uh, so uh, anybody that's listening in that's got ideas, wishes we would do a program on you know, X, Y, or Z, uh, we'd ask you to communicate that with your uh, local branch office. Uh, we're always looking for ideas and, and also suggestions on how we can make the uh, webinar series more helpful to you. Uh, this morning we have two uh, outstanding speakers to talk about the new uh, uh, Dairy Margin Protection Program, kind of a new uh, terminology, a new tool uh, in our toolbox uh, in the dairy industry. Uh, and uh, I don't believe in long, flowery introductions, but uh, I'll start with Professor uh, Andy Novakovic from Cornell University. Uh, Andy is a uh, you know, veteran and highly respected uh, leader in the Northeast dairy industry, uh, the American U.S. dairy industry. But uh, um, uh, he spent a career uh, working in the uh, dairy policy, dairy marketing uh, field, uh, has been uh, uh, involved in a lot of the key uh, decisions and uh, outcomes for the Northeast uh, dairy industry during that uh, period of time, uh, various dairy policy programs that have been enacted dating back to the uh, early 1980s. Uh, uh, Any time milk marketing orders got changed, Andy was right in there. And of course, uh, being involved in the education of a great uh, number of uh, students over that time. So uh, Andy's a great friend of uh, Farm Credit and uh, somebody we respect greatly for his uh, expertise uh, in the area. So we're pleased to have him. And uh, co-presenting with him uh, is somebody kind of new to our program, but uh, we're very excited, Dr. John Newton, uh, who is assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Uh, and in visiting with John uh, in the past few minutes, uh, he tells me that uh, he had the and the good fortune to start researching uh, this program a couple of years ago when he was working on his PhD and, uh, and then worked with uh, Senate Chairman Stabenow uh, last summer during the, uh, the Senate uh, portion of the deliberation. And uh, so uh, he started early uh, in this topic, has uh, developed a lot of uh, uh, information and methodology as to how to go about analyzing the program. And uh, so he uh, is going to uh, co-present with Andy, and uh, we'll, I'm going to leave it up to the, the two gentlemen here as to how they uh, hand off to each other. Um, would encourage you, we'll take questions. Uh, there's a text chat box over on the right uh, hand uh, side of your go-to webinar. Sometimes it collapses itself. You have to uh, uncollapse it. Uh, but uh, if you've got questions, type those in, and we'll try to uh, get to those late in the program. And so with those preliminaries, uh, I'd like to introduce you all and welcome uh, Professor John Newton to kick off our program. Go ahead, John. Uh, Andy, is Andy available here? Yes. Uh, can you hear me all right? We can, Andy. Good to have you oh. online. I understand you've uh, been struggling with some technical issues this morning. That's oh, always a yeah. bad way to start uh, your day. Well, yeah, and especially, of course, when you actually need your computer to be reliable. Well, anyway, folks, let's, uh, let's get going. I've got a few uh, warm-up slides here for the main act, and John will come on and, and uh, uh, give you quite a bit more detail. John has been spending a lot of time not only working on the tool but thinking about how this program will work. And so um, uh, he's going to uh, have a lot of information to share with you. Uh, first of all, as this slide indicates, um, I'm very pleased that John and I are part of a group uh, that has been asked by USDA 
to uh, create the, a decision tool and then bring that tool uh, to the industry to help them think through what kind of decisions they want to make on this new program. Uh, and there are elements of this program that uh, you know sound kind of familiar, the insurance thing, I know what a margin is, uh, MILC gave us some idea about signing up and telling the government about production issues, but there's a lot about this program that's uh, really brand new, and, it, and I know a lot of farmers really haven't had time to uh, really think about it, and for that matter, uh, USDA is still developing the rules, so it's all pretty early. Um, but our group is going to uh, try to help folks with uh, explanatory materials about the program, uh, materials that uh, describe how the tool can be used and how it can be interpreted uh, by decision makers, uh, and then uh, maybe help folks think a little bit about uh, uh, how they might approach the decision. And I, I know that uh, farm credit around the country is going to be instrumental in working with uh, your clients and, and helping think that through as well. Uh, next slide, please, John. Yes. So the, there are several uh, uh, things that uh, are, are critical uh, for our understanding that haven't been defined yet. Uh, the legislation gives us uh, well, quite a bit of detail. Certainly, we've, we've got a, a very good idea what this program is about. But as always is the case with regulations, uh, uh, there are details that are left to the U.S. Department of Agriculture to work out. Uh, we, uh, John and I, are very familiar with the legislation. We have uh, hunches, if you will, about what some of these rules will be. But we uh, hasten to, to make the disclaimer that uh, FSA will be providing the rules. And uh, uh, what we say the rule is is hardly the final authority, um, no matter how confident we might be. Next slide, please. So uh, we get the question pretty regularly, uh, what, what exactly is this program going to do? And you know, maybe I participated in uh, the Livestock Gross Margin Dairy product, or if I didn't participate in, uh, in it, uh, I went to a seminar and I heard about it. I think I know what it means. Uh, is that what this is? You know, LGM seems to have something to do with margins. They, it's called some kind of insurance product. Uh, you got to work with an agent to get it. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, I'm, most everyone is very familiar with uh, the milk income loss contract that we've had for uh, over a decade. Um, there are elements of this program uh, that are a little bit uh, like MILC, and uh, John will, will unravel and unwrap a lot of this, but I would just say in, in broad strokes, it has elements of both of these programs. It has elements of sign up, and if a certain thing triggers, I get a check, just like MILC, but it also has elements of uh, an insurance program or LGM dairy in particular. Uh, a lot of folks thought of LGM dairy as pretty complicated. Uh, this one uh, is not probably quite so complicated, but it has its own complexities and needs to be approached kind of with a clean slate as to what it is and how it works. Uh, this uh, has implications for how, how folks approach the decision, and it's uh, going to be quite a bit more complicated uh, than MILC, but perhaps a little bit less so than, than LGM dairy. Uh, next slide, please. John's going to go through the details, but I just want to hit the highlights, and I, I think a lot of you have heard Mark Stevenson talk about this and probably others as well, uh, but let me frame it this way. Uh, what, what do different people know and what are different people's responsibilities uh, in this overall program? Farmers get to pick how much milk they cover. It has to be a percentage of what is established as their base production. Uh, typically the high volume for annual volume for the last three years, but that's a that's a farmer number. Uh, you you your base is your base, and you get to choose uh, in a pretty wide range, 25 to 90 percent within that base. That's that's your number. You also get to pick your margin level, ranges from four dollars to eight dollars and fifty cent increments. That's a farmer choice. After that, there's a lot of choices that aren't your choices. Uh, USDA picks the numbers. USDA picks the dollars uh, 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 per hundred weight uh, for prices. It calculates uh, what milk, what corn, what soybean meal, uh, what alfalfa. It, it, the formula is calculated. 
according to the legislation. Those are not your numbers, they're not farmer numbers, those are national numbers that uh, are controlled by the legislation and USDA estimates. Uh, they calculate the trigger uh, at what is the margin today or for a pair of months. They will determine when a farmer gets billed for his premium charges. They will determine when a farmer gets paid. Those are some of the rules yet to come out. I think we should be hopeful uh, that uh, they will do that in a farmer-friendly way, but at this point neither John or I know. And then, of course, there's a very important element of this that's out of the control of either farmers or the United States Department of Agriculture. And that's what happens to the marketplace. Uh, our feed price is going to be high. Our milk price is going to be low. Are they going to be good? Are they going to start out good and at least from a farmer's perspective and then get bad? Those are obviously market effects. And so uh, farmers will be challenged to uh, think and, and estimate and uh, uh, calculate as best they can what their price expectations are for the coming year and how much of that uh, margin risk they want to try to cover. So we don't know a lot of details, including when the final rule will be published, when enrollment starts, and when it ends. Uh, we know that this is all going to happen in kind of a rush uh, on the handoff between summer and autumn. Uh, but at this point, um, uh, I don't know if uh, enrollment will start in the middle or, or late September, whether it will end in October or even possibly November. And of course, that's going to be a challenge for all of us in trying to uh, come to grips with what we want to do with this program. Next slide, please. So this begins John's part, and I'll, and I'll hand it over to him. All right, great. Can you hear me? Okay. First of all, I want to thank Farm Credit for, for having uh, myself and Andy to give this presentation. And where I want to start is just with a screenshot of, of the dairy decision tool that, that we've been working on. Uh, as Andy mentioned earlier, we've partnered with the USDA to help develop web-based decision aids uh, for the margin protection program as well as LGM Dairy. And so what you see here is a screenshot of forecasted margins uh, using CME prices for class 3 milk, class 4 milk, corn and soybean meal. We use those prices to convert it uh, to USDA announced prices and a subsequent income over fee cost margin. Uh, the bands around the black line represent uh, a confidence interval, if you may, of what projected margins may look like over the next 17 to 18 months. We use these price expectations uh, to help farmers make decisions about what level of margin coverage uh, best protects their farm uh, for the upcoming calendar year or fiscal year, uh, however the program parameters may be. Uh, this is a screenshot that shows the expected indemnities uh, the net revenue, the return on the investment, and the fees and premiums of participating at the various coverage options. So as you can see, we have all nine coverage options listed from four to eight dollars. Uh, the cost of participation uh, for this particular dairy uh, is listed. I believe this one is for a, a dairy with an eight million pound production history. Uh, farmers can enter their pounds on the welcome or get started screen. And this, this table here will help them uh, to make decisions on which coverage option uh, may provide the best risk management for their operation. Uh, included in this decision tool is a LGM Dairy Analyzer. Now this is something that Dr. Brian Gould at Wisconsin has spent a number of years working on and we've worked to integrate it with the MPP Dairy Decision Tool so that farmers participating in either program will have a place to go to get web-based decision support to, to help manage risk on their farm operation. And that's the end of the plug on our web-based decision efforts. Uh, let's get into what the MPP, MPP program actually does. Uh, so it provides a voluntary framework for farmers uh, to protect production margins from four to eight dollars per hundred weight. Uh, again, this is a number that USDA selects, as Andy mentioned earlier. In order to participate, farmers have to pay an annual fee of $100, and that gets them the $4 coverage up to 90% uh, of their pro production history. In order to participate at higher coverage levels, from $450 to $8, uh, farmers would have to pay a, a premium. Margin Protection Program does not guarantee a profit or minimum income for dairy farmers. 
Also, it, it doesn't include a milk production quota or prevent any dairy operation from expanding. The key elements for the margin protection program, uh, as everyone is probably well aware, is we have the all milk price, we have a NAS corn price, an AMS soybean meal price, and a NAS alfalfa hay price. These are national prices announced by the USDA every single month. These are used to construct the income over feed cost margin or the dairy production margin. These ration elements cannot be customized. So it's unlike LGM dairy that is highly flexible to a dairy operation. A farmer can buy coverage on their production history. The production history is defined as the maximum calendar year production over 2011, 12, or 13. The production history of a farmer is revised annually by the USDA based on growth in the milk production. And farmers are paid an indemnity payment based on their production history they're not paid based on actual milk production. Uh, so think of this as almost a base acres type of program for dairy. As Andy mentioned, there are several key farmer decisions uh, each year. And those two decisions are the coverage percentage between 25 and 90 percent in 5% five, 5 increments, and the coverage level from 4 to $8 in 50 cent increments. When you combine these two, there are 126 possible coverage combinations that a farmer can select under MPP. Now there is a question uh, about how premiums are calculated. I'm going to go back to Andy on this one. Andy? Yes, sir? Uh, yes, this is uh, the definition of 4 million pounds. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. So you want me to talk about this? Yeah. So here's the uh, here's the deal. Uh, you know, the this margin program went through three years of conversation and had several variations in the legislation that was written up, going back to the original Dairy Security Act that Colin Peterson uh, crafted with the National Milk Producers Federation. As you recall, in the House, uh, a, a variation on that program was introduced by Congressman uh, Goodland and, and Goodlatte and Scott. And in that rewriting and then the Senate version, there were subtle changes in the language that a lot of us could kind of sort of say, oh, it's pretty much the same thing. Well, it turns out one of the things that um, uh, evolved is how we interpret what it means when you can say there's a break point at 4 million pounds. And the key question is, does this 4 million pounds relate to how much base a farmer has, his annual production on an operation? Or does it relate to the amount of milk enrolled in the program? So for example, is it the case that if you're a 4 million pound farm, you get the lower premium? If you're a 5 million pound farm, you don't. Is it the case that if you're an 8 million pound farm and you only enroll half of your, your milk, 50% times 8 is 4, so you get the premium on the 4 that you enroll. The Congress uh, or members of Congress who care about this program and the National Milk Producers Federation have said this uh, decision should be uh, based on pounds of milk in your, in, uh, in your enrollment. So whatever your, your total production is, you enroll up to 4 million, you get that lower premium. Above that, you kick uh, into the higher premium rate. Uh, USDA initially made a determination, its lawyers made an initial determination that that was not uh, specified in the act and that they were interpreting it as prorating your base. So an 8 million pound per year farm who enrolled 50% would enroll 4, 4 million pounds, but because he was twice over the base, he would have half of his premium at the low rate and half of his premium at the high rate, even though it was 4 million pounds. That may be kind of clear as mud, but what it means is if you're less than 4 million pounds, 185 cows or so, you're golden. It doesn't matter. If you're really, really big, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot. You're going to pay a higher premium, but it's probably rounding. But if you're in that kind of middle range of 500, 750, 900 cows, depending on your uh, premium percentage, uh, this could make a fair difference in your total premium. It's one of those things we won't know until the final rules are issued. 
Exactly. Thank you, Andy. And, and I will add that the results I, I will present as we move forward are using this, the first four million pound covered uh, gets the lower premium rate. So the, I'm using the method by which uh, Andy indicated National Milk and others, the, the House Dairy Caucus have uh, suggested premiums should be calculated. There we are. So an interesting feature of the MPP program is that premiums are fixed for the five-year life of the farm bill. Uh, unlike LGM Dairy, whose premiums are calculated uh, during every contract offering, these rates are fixed. So there is a premium discount of 25% for the 2014 and 2015 calendar year uh, MPP protection options uh, at coverage levels below 750. For the, I believe it's for the first four million pounds. Uh, and these premium rates may alter participation incentives, as Andy indicated, especially for the farmers uh, in that middle range uh, that are above four million pounds of production history, but not so large that their premiums are, are, are skewed toward that higher coverage level. And as you can see in, in the slide here, when you increase from six fifty to seven dollar coverage, you get fifty cents of additional coverage, but that carries an additional fifty four cents in insurance premium rates. So how these premium rates are determined will impact uh, your participation incentives and the risk management potential of MPP dairy. As we indicated earlier, there are one hundred and twenty six possible coverage combinations. So as you move to the right and and up in this grid here, you get greater protection at greater cost. So that, that lends itself to, to think about what are some potential strategies with MPP dairy. Uh, the first strategy is a passive strategy in where you keep your coverage options fixed for the life of the farm bill. Uh, for example, you every year you decide you're going to cover half of your milk at the 650 coverage level and the other half of the milk you're going to use traditional forward or futures contracts to manage that risk. Another strategy would be a dynamic decision where you change the coverage levels uh, each year based on anticipated risk in milk and feed markets. You may have the opportunity to annually select among LGM dairy and, and MPP or, or uh, using traditional futures and forward contracts. Uh, or you could integrate MPP dairy with your existing risk management activities. And I'll go through each of these four options uh, now. So let's first look at a passive MPP strategy and the performance. This dashboard shows a, a farm with a production history of 8 million pounds. And we can select a coverage percentage of 90%. And we can select a margin protection level of 650. A passive strategy, from, if you were to look backwards at the milk and feed prices from 2006 to the end of 2013, a passive strategy of 650 coverage uh, would have indicated uh, an average net indemnity, this is the indemnity less the premium cost, of 34 cents for that, this particular dairy operation with 8 million pounds of production history. Uh, if you increase it to a higher coverage option, let's say $8 at 90%, uh, the average net indemnity goes down because the average premium increases here to $0.87 cents per hundredweight. A key feature that Andy noted earlier is what if your coverage percentage is, is 50%? So here we're going to take this 8 million pound production history, we're going to cover half, at, so that, that's 4 million pounds. The average premium per hundred weight drops to 48 cents or 47 and a half cents, and the average net indemnity of this passive strategy is 57 cents per hundred weight. This works fairly well for your small to medium sized dairy operations. But for larger dairies, let's say 60 million pounds of production history, a passive strategy does not work as well. Here, the $8 coverage costs $1.24 if you cover half of this 60 million pound dairy, if you cover 90% uh, the average premium per hundred weight jumps to $1.29 and the average net return of MPP over this this lifetime is negative 24 cents. Uh, so a passive strategy uh, may not work well as you as you 
as the dairy farm increases in, in herd size. Uh, here's 650 at 90%. The passive strategy uh, has a positive average net indemnity of 24 cents. Again, this is strictly for demonstrative purposes, but it indicates that a passive strategy may not always work well uh, for a dairy operation. You may want to consider uh, perhaps a more dynamic strategy. We've indicated that there's really no sweet spot for passive coverage. There's, there's not a coverage level that will always have positive returns. And for your very large dairies, uh, passive strategy may be net income over fee cost uh, margin reducing. For example, the $8 coverage over the 2006 to 13 periods. Now, I will add that when you look back at those historical prices uh, and then you impose the MPP program on those, uh, it's just a, a demonstrative analysis. Had we actually had MPP over the, that time period, the milk and feed prices that we observed would have been different. But it does demonstrate that, that maybe we should consider how a dynamic strategy may work. And a dynamic strategy is one in which you change your coverage options uh, each year based on anticipated risk uh, in milk and feed markets. So let's see an example. Let's look at uh, 2010, for example. We'll go with a coverage level of $4 and a coverage percentage of 90. So this, this would be the free coverage. Again, we have a production history of 8 million pounds. Uh, here you see the net benefit of participation was just negative $100. That's the $100 administrative fee. Had this farm elected a higher coverage option, let's say $8 per hundred weight, the average net benefit for this dairy would have been uh, a loss of, not a loss, a payment of $50,000, seen here equating to about 71 cents per hundred weight. So during a year in which you have anticipated favorable margins, you may be able to roll back your coverage uh, to a lower level, perhaps 650 that carries a, an 18 cent uh, premium per hundred weight. Uh, but in a year like 2013, when we came off of the drought of 2012, you could easily anticipate that margins were going to be low for the upcoming calendar year based on the prior year's uh, feed production. So you could roll up coverage, let's say to $8 per hundred weight. In this particular example, a farm with an 8 million pound production history covering 90% would have an average net benefit of 64 cents a hundred weight or $45,000. If they select lower coverage options, the per hundred weight benefit declines, the total farm payment also declines to, to $23,000. So as we see, there is the potential to adjust your coverage each year based on anticipated risk in, in milk and feed markets. So what would, what would that translate to? Well, if you anticipate bad margins, you buy greater protection, $8.90%. If you anticipate that margins are going to be good, maybe you reduce coverage. Uh, $4 at 90% only costs $100. Uh, for some of the smaller to medium-sized dairies, 650 coverage uh, is less than a dime. So maybe somewhere in this middle range uh, you'd find risk, risk protection under MPP. But the point is that a dynamic strategy uh, can increase, the, uh, improve the performance of MPP versus a passive strategy. The question then is, will lenders allow dairy farmers to move so freely among coverage levels? Uh, that's a question that we don't know the answer to at this point, but it, but it is an interesting one. Will lenders allow dairy farmers to go from $4 in one year to $8 in, in another year? Will they prefer that their dairymen uh, stay around a, a $6.50, $7 level and maybe move up, up from there uh, during years of anticipated poor margins? And what do we think margins are going to look like over the next five years? Uh, to, to answer that, Andy's going to come back in and give us a, uh, an expectation over the next five years of, of where we think milk and feed prices may go. Andy? Yeah, well, uh, one thing I'm sure not going to do is tell you what those prices are going to be, but I, I am going to try to uh, alert you or ask you uh, to think about uh, how one might 
uh, go about imagining and uh, anticipating prices, at least for the coming year. Keep in mind, when you make your margin selection, uh, it will be for a one-year period. Now, the point in time at which you make that decision might be uh, uh, September, uh, probably not this year, but in, in once the program gets rolling. And uh, perhaps you'll be asked to uh, make a decision relative to October through the following September of the next year. So it could be um, a little more than a year, but basically a year time frame. Uh, and you'll have to think through, okay, what, what kind of year do I anticipate? Uh, what might be uh, the situation that I face? And, and what kind of risk profile do I have? My, uh, of course, this is always something we, we uh, try to think about and plan. And I, uh, folks like John and I get asked these questions all the time. Uh, let me just make a few comments uh, that I, I hope will be uh, uh, helpful in sort of getting our head around how can I even go about thinking about this expectations decision. Uh, in the decision tool that we're developing, and, and probably uh, if there are uh, other folks out there uh, doing similar work, then I suspect they'll do uh, similar to what we do, we're, we're using futures market information to create a range of price expectations, to give producers an idea based on those futures markets, not just uh, what the price in August of 2015 might be, but what kind of probability range there's around that. We're using these futures markets uh, because it's generally believed these are kind of a broad industry opinion. And, and certainly for <clears throat> corn and soybeans, uh, uh, that's uh, long been accepted as a you know, pretty decent indicator of the market opinion. No guarantees, of course. With milk, it's a little more complicated. You've got the class three and the class four contract. The class three contract is pretty good, but it's nothing like corn. So the quality of that opinion might be a little more suspect, but it begs the question, you know, what else are you going to look at? Well, USDA makes quarterly projections. Um, we will be sharing the information of USDA's projections uh, when we release our tool. And so you can take a look at that and see what you think. Uh, uh, there are other places that do similar work. Uh, uh, our friends at the University of Missouri in an organization called uh, the Food and, Food and Ag Policy Research Institute also do baseline and uh, uh, provide some commentaries on what they think the coming year will be. Uh, they have a particularly strong focus on feed grains, and uh, you know their opinion uh, uh, is based on a lot of years of working in that industry and knowledge. Uh, likewise, of course, uh, the University of Illinois, where John is, uh, has a great group of people that are on the, almost on a daily basis uh, taking a look at feed grain markets. And if you're not familiar with their website, uh, I would encourage you to add it to the, your list of things to uh, kind of make a bookmark on and, and, and look at. On milk, a lot of us uh, look to people like Bob Kropp at the University of Wisconsin, who still has his monthly chat with Mark and publishes his monthly column of what he thinks is coming down uh, the pipeline. Your co-op economists and other folks are going to be providing these uh, opinions. I, while the futures market is great, I think it's, it's uh, particularly as you approach a decision, it's good to dip your toe in a lot of those waters. and. Uh, get a sense of where's the risk. Is the risk more on the downside or the things are a little bit more bullish and on the upside? Uh, as, you, as many of you know, uh, we've done a lot of work at Cornell to persuade ourselves that there's an underlying cyclical character in milk prices. And uh, uh, that's not to say the same cycle is, uh, pertains to margins, but it, it, we think it still has an influence on milk prices. And you know that doesn't create a firm prediction, but it does tell us that how a year looks when you sign up certainly isn't going to be a good predictor of how the year looks when it comes to an end, either on the plus or the minus. Um, right now, things are looking great and maybe the best ever, but we uh, fully anticipate that margins will tighten as we get deeper into 2015. Actually, we think they'll probably be pretty good through, the, through 2015, but they'll definitely soften. And, it's an example, at least, of uh, don't get too wrapped up in what's happening at the moment, because you've got to think those, those uh, 12 months ahead. And of course, we all appreciate uh, that there's just a lot of volatility in all our markets right now. Uh, and one of the things that I believe is, is really key in dairy 
that's a little new for us, and, and certainly important in feed grains, although not so new, is uh, what's happening in international markets. And so as, you, as farmers approach this uh, decision annually, uh, I would definitely dip my toe into what are the conditions in world markets and uh, how might that influence my expectations for future prices. Thank you, John. Thank you, Andy. To summarize, you, you really can't outperform the futures market. Uh, and so you can look at these big picture market fundamentals and, and then think about the tools available to help you manage risk. So there's futures and options contracts. Uh, dairymen can enter into forward contracts with their cooperative uh, or a manufacturing plant uh, for classes two through four milk. Uh, you also have LGM dairy and you have MPP the last two of which are both USDA programs. There we are. So LGM dairy or MPP, let's think about that. Uh, the Farm Bill essentially states that dairy farmers can participate in MPP or LGM dairy, but not both. Now it doesn't say whether or not the enrollment as MPP is for five years, or if it's an annual decision. So it's important to think about that, and if it is an annual decision, there may be an opportunity to choose between LGM and MPP as your government safety net uh, each year. If it's not an annual decision and it's a five-year enrollment for MPP, then you need to weigh the options of LGM's flexibility uh, versus MPP's availability. So LGM dairy is, is very flexible, but it's limited by its underwriting capacity. It's, it's offered on a first-come, first-served basis only, whereas MPP is going to always be available. It will always be available at the same coverage options, and it will always cost the same. So we summarize. LGM Dairy is very dynamic and fully customizable, but MPP is, is more static. Both programs can offer risk protection to a dairyman but both programs also have some basis risk. So it's important to think about where your farm margin is and how both of these programs may interact with your operation. Let's look at LGM Dairy. Here we have LGM Dairy price floors constructed in November for the following 10-month contract offering. So if, for example, in November 2008, we can construct a 10-month price floor for 2009. Now, I use the price floors uh, from LGM Dairy. I use margins that as closely resemble those under MPP as possible. So I, I use the MPP feed ration uh, subject to the LGM feed constraints to construct a, a price floor margin. And as we can see, the price floor moves based on anticipated risk in milk and feed markets. Uh, in 2008, November, uh, the average margin for the January through October 10 month period was 746. In 2010, the average price floor was 732. Uh, but in 2011, 12, and 13, price expectations changed. Uh, in 2012 of November, we're coming off of the drought. 10 month price floors for 2013 were only 543. So the guaranteed price floor under LGM Dairy, while it's fully customizable, it's limited in that it can only offer protection at the market supported levels. So when the market anticipates bad margins, you could have a low price floor as we have here in 2011 through 13. But when the market anticipates that margins are going to be favorable, you can lock in a high price floor. And you may be able to lock in a price floor that's higher than the price floor offered under MPP Dairy. So that is something to consider. These are two philosophically different approaches. The Margin Protection Program is a target deficiency payment program that provides protection against single or multi-year losses in farm equity. And the coverage is available from $4 to $8 per hundred weight every year. It, it's not tied to uh, market supply and demand fundamentals, which means it's not actuarially fair. It's not based on the milk and feed price expectations. The premium rates are fixed for the life of the farm bill which makes it fairly simple and easy to use. Under MPP, the indemnity payments are made only when the margin falls below the user-selected coverage level uh, over a consecutive two-month period. 
and there are no payment limitations or adjusted gross income caps on eligibility like we had under the MILC program. LGM Dairy is a futures and options based risk management strategy. It protects an average gross margin at the prevailing market prices, which means the price floor will move up or down based on anticipated risk in milk and feed markets. And it's designed to be actuarially fair pre-subsidy. Indemnity payments with LGM are only made at the end of the coverage period. So if you have a 10-month coverage period, it's possible uh, for low margin indemnity payments to be offset by higher margins later in the coverage period. Also, LGM Dairy lacks sufficient underwriting capacity for continuous coverage and is only available on a first-come, first-served basis. So these are two different approaches that dairymen will need to think about as they decide how to uh, integrate the government programs with their risk management uh, instruments. I mentioned that if the participation in LGM Dairy is annual, uh, there may be an opportunity to switch among the two programs such that you enroll in the margin protection program when the market forecasts greater risks of low margins and when the market forecasts less risk of low margins you switch to LGM Dairy and lock in a higher price floor. But what if the participation is not annual? What if it's a five-year enrollment? Well then maybe the optimal switching would occur with futures and forwards and MPP Dairy. So let's look at an example of hedging with MPP Dairy. So what I did here is I estimated a hedge ratio with and without MPP. And this is a hedge ratio for the Wisconsin mailbox milk price. I used class three futures only. I had a six month hedging horizon and I used margin protection coverage at 90%. Again, this is an illustration only. Had margin protection program been in place, historical futures and cash market prices may have been different. But what we see is that Without coverage, the optimal hedge ratio, defined as the covariance among cash and futures market prices, uh, divided by the variance of futures market prices, without MPP coverage is 80%. This means that a dairyman hedging the Wisconsin mailbox milk price should cover 80% of his cash market risk with Class 3 futures. However, as we add MPP coverage from 4, 450, 5, all the way up to 8, you see a steady decline in the optimal hedge ratio. This means that as you integrate MPP into your risk management portfolio, you can reduce your use of futures market contracts. Such that $8, 90% coverage, you only have an optimal hedge ratio of 50, 52%. Uh, that's a 35% decline in class three hedge ratio. So there could be an offsetting feature with the introduction of MPP in that it, it reduces the need to use futures and forwards contracts consistently. So let's look at how these, these programs could, could impact the Wisconsin mailbox milk price. Here we see the, the MPP program. Uh, the green areas represent where the MPP uh, would make an indemnity payment to, to the farmer, and this is the Wisconsin mailbox milk price. Uh, this is a farm with four million pound production history covering $8 per hundred weight at 90 percent. We see that there's support during price declines. The average Wisconsin mailbox milk price without the MPP was $16.07 per hundred weight and with MPP it increased to $16.41 and then the variability in the Wisconsin mailbox milk price also decreased uh, as the, income, as the uh, margin protection program helped to smooth prices. But what if we use futures and MPP using the hedge ratio of 52%? Again, we're, we're protecting the Wisconsin mailbox milk price at 180 days with class three futures. We have a four million pound production history, $8 coverage at 90%. The blue area represents the return from futures markets. The green represents the return from M MPP. The orange area represents uh, your costs of using futures markets and the red area represents the net premium that you would pay under MPP dairy. And the result is that when you use both simultaneously you get double support during price declines such that without using anything your average price is 1607 but when you use both combined 
the average Wisconsin mailbox milk price was 1625. Now that's lower than the 1641 we saw on the previous slide of using MPP alone. The reason why it's lower is you're paying twice for coverage. So you pay not only uh, for the futures market transaction, but you're also paying for MPP dairy. Uh, so it's that even though you get double support during price declines, you also pay twice. So maybe there's a better way to integrate the two. Uh, we, we, we saw in the previous slide that MPP may be a substitute to uh, futures and forward contracts. We saw a reduction in the hedge ratio. Uh, it's, it's undetermined how that would impact feed risk management. And then we saw that farmers can essentially double up when combining MPP and, and forward and futures contracts. But it is costly. You're hedging greater than 100%, so perhaps you'd consider alternating among risk management tools such that you'd use futures and forwards when you anticipate favorable prices and then roll into MPP when you anticipate prices uh, to be lower. So let's look at an example of alternating. So when margins are above the MPP coverage levels of 4 to 8, you buy less MPP and you increase the use of CME futures options, forward contracts, or LGM dairy if you're allowed. When anticipated margins are below the MPP coverage levels, you buy more MPP and you roll back the use of CME futures and options and forward contracting. So here's an example. If you anticipate low margins, here the average margin is well below the $8 uh, MPP coverage level. So under this scenario, perhaps the strategy would be to buy MPP coverage at the highest level. Again, this is for demonstration only. Here, if you anticipate a high margin, such that the margin over the 12 months is above the MPP coverage level of $8. Perhaps the strategy would include using futures and forwards and rolling back coverage of MPP down to 4 and $9. Uh, under such a strategy, you still lock in a price using futures and forward contracting, uh, and then you, you protect a, a minimum price floor using MPP dairy. So you still have risk management in place. Let's look at how that would perform. So here again, we're going back to the Wisconsin mailbox milk price. We're hedging at 180 days out. Uh, we're using futures and MPP, and we're using MPP at $8.90%. And, and we see that we roll out here in this green area. We're rolling out of futures and rolling into MPP dairy. There's some overlap uh, since we have a 180-day hedging interval. Uh, you're rolling out of futures contracts around September, October for the following calendar year when, whenever you enroll in MPP. When you don't enroll in MPP, you continue the 180-day uh, rolling hedging strategy. And we're using a hedge ratio of 52% here. And what we see is you're no longer paying twice. You're not paying in the futures market and you're not paying an MD MPP premium at the same time as frequently. So that's going to increase the, the average price. Secondly, you still have opportunity to, to receive some double support whenever margins uh, rapidly decline and you get an M, uh, MPP payment. So let's look at this. We see that switching reduces the downside risk. The average margin for this Wisconsin mailbox price over 2008 to 13 with no protection at all was 1767. If you had MPP alone, it was 1857, and that's a result of the uh, indemnity payments made less the premiums. Uh, if you use the double strategy, where you use both simultaneously all the time, your average price was 1868, somewhat higher due to the uh, shorter duration of, of observed prices from 2008 to 13 versus our prior observation of 2001 to 13. But we see that a switching strategy where you roll out of futures and roll into MPP uh, whenever you anticipate prices are, are going to decline has the highest average uh, Wisconsin mailbox milk price of 1883. So perhaps there's a way uh, to think about integrating MPP at a farm level such that you can get the, the best of both worlds. To wrap up, essentially, and I'm going to take a, a phrase from uh, the chairwoman, is MPP 
helps to get skin in the game. It's, it's an educational program to help dairy farmers learn uh, that we're moving away from a countercyclical payment program of MILC to a, a more crop insurance style program. Uh, and that's what M MPP is. It, it can provide revenue support uh, during single or multi-year losses in farm equity. Now, a passive strategy may not always work well. It may work better for smaller operations than the larger dairies. And so a, a dynamic strategy uh, may be considered. We've shown that you can integrate it with futures and options to improve risk management at the farm, but what level of integration is best? Uh, to, to make that determination, it would be smart to look at uh, your farm level margins, the correlations among those and the MPP margins, and also to determine what level of basis exposure you, you may have, and also look at your farm balance sheet. But the overall goal of MPP is to shift dairymen into a new era. So it's uncoupled from market supply and demand signals so that it's easier to use. What that means is we've, we fix the premiums, we fix the coverage levels. It's, it's very easy to understand and it offers continuous support uh, to dairymen. And maybe in, in future farm bills, as, as the educational process continues, uh, we can make this a, a more actuarially fair program by re-rating it annually. Uh, but the goal is currently to shift dairymen into this new era of risk management and away from uh, countercyclical payment programs. Andy mentioned a lot of these unanswered questions at the beginning, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on those. Uh, but we do have uh, questions with respect to the sign-up deadline. Uh, whether participation is going to be five years or annual, and how will the premiums be calculated. Uh, additionally, there, there are questions with respect to treatment of new operations versus the expansion of existing dairies. And so we expect that the FSA regulations uh, will provide additional clarity. Andy and I wish to thank you for participating in this webinar. And I believe we can take questions now. Unless, Andy, do you have anything else to, to add? Uh, well, maybe just one, one thing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as the dentist told me when I broke one of my front teeth, uh, you don't have to do anything, but uh, probably you'll want to. Uh, I think uh, as we approach this, there's going to be a lot of intensity around should I sign up for the margin protection plan, should I sign up low? Should I sign up high? Uh, and the focus will clearly be on that program for obvious uh, reasons. Uh, I think we need to see this as a great opportunity to have a risk management conversation with, our, with dairy farmers, whether they're clients or people that <clears throat> come to extension meetings or whatever relationship uh, those of you on the line may have with them, including being a farmer yourself. Uh, you know, the, the time to think about insurance is not when the house is on fire. This is a great year. Uh, it's the perfect time to be thinking about what is, what is my risk profile? What is my risk situation? What is the consequence to me if I don't manage risk at this level or risk at that level? Uh, there's a lot of different tools, including uh, entering a forward contract with your co-op and letting them worry about hedging that contract. Uh, and so on. And uh, I think we, we need to approach this not just entirely focused on this new government program, but really on the bigger picture. With that, I'd, I'd love to hear questions from the audience. Okay, we are going to open it up then. Uh, I'm going to leave the microphone open to both speakers uh, so that uh, they can, uh, you know, uh, they uh, pa pass the, the microphone back and forth. Uh, first question, is uh, I know that the final regs are not complete, but I'm wondering if the dashboard is available now with your assumptions built in uh, so the producers can mess around with different options. Uh, John, what's the, what's the deal on the uh, web, web uh, tool and the dashboard? Well, the, the, the official web tool that USDA is partnering with us to develop uh, is not available, and it won't be available until the regs are final. Uh, but the dashboards uh, are available uh, both on farmdocdaily.com. Uh, so if you go to the FarmDoc uh, website, you can find uh, a links to the dashboard under my uh, profile, John Newton. Or you can go to the Farm Credit East webinars 
a slide and I've embedded both dashboards in a PDF there. So yes, they are available. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, start the, the next question with Andy, and uh, but, but uh, let you take it from there. Who's done the work of looking at historical futures market prices that relate to MPP and compared them to actual prices? For example, what were the markets saying in 2008, 2007 and 8 about uh, cash market prices in 2009? You know, in other words, how how good is, are the futures at telling us what lies ahead? Uh, if if yeah, I can, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I will add that uh, the the decision tool does do that, uh, and as part of my dissertation, I did look at that question and. And six out of the seven years that, that I looked at, uh, our forecasting technique uh, was very accurate. So we, we have a, a pretty high success rate. And, and then I'll add that you really can't outperform the futures markets uh, over that type of time horizon. Andy, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Yeah, in fact, uh, just to, to punctuate uh, John's comment, um, in the tool that uh, we've already done just a lot of work on, there is going to be a, a screen, a, a pay, place where you can play what we're calling a what-if game. So what if it was uh, September of 2008 and you had to make an enrollment decision to start on October of 2009 and ending September of 2010? What would the futures market information at that point in time told us using the same mathematics in this tool? You know, that's kind of, uh, who cares, it's water over the dam. But I think if producers play around with that, it will give them perhaps some sense of how much confidence you can have when you're standing in, you know, September of 2014 looking at the next 12 months. Um, as I, I said, a lot of times these futures markets are characterized as a market opinion, as the collective opinion of hundreds, thousands of buyers and sellers using uh, that marketplace. And, uh, you know, uh, are, is, are, are they right? Uh, you know, probably not. Uh, we've got plenty of experience in, in knowing that sometimes when we guess down the road, uh, we don't guess very well. But as John said, uh, you know, if you got a better guess, by all means, use it. Uh, and so this is why we're putting these probability distributions around these prices. Uh, which also acts as, accesses information that's embedded in the uh, transactions on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to say, uh, we can tell you a little something about how confident people are in these and factor it in. But at the end of the day, uh, you got to pull the trigger with uh, your best guess and best information. And, and this is just simply a way of sharing the best we can give you in terms of expected price information. Okay, next question. Uh, kind of an interesting one. Can a dairy still receive the insurance payments if they have exited the dairy operation? In other words, I presume the question is, is saying they enter into the contract, say, you know, October 1st, uh, February 1st, they decide to uh, sell the cows. Would they still be eligible to receive the uh, payments under the original contract? Uh, this will be... Uh uh, clearly specified in the FSA rules, but I think what you can expect is that payment will be made on whatever your coverage uh, percentage is of your base. So let's say, you know, it happened to be a million pounds for a pair of months, or the, uh, the amount of milk you actually produced if it's lower. And of course, if you produce zero, then zero means zero. So I, I think that's how it's going to lay out. Again, this is one of those things that FSA will, will speak clearly about, but I, I don't think there's going to be any manna from heaven on this program. Right. I'll, I'll add that both the House and Senate uh, passed farm bills had provisions which paid you uh, either the minimum of your two-month production history or your actual production over the two-month period, and that language was uh, ultimately did not make the final conference report bill. Uh, but, there, but there is a provision in it that, that would prevent uh, any, any sort of uh, gaming of, of the payment structure. Uh, so the secretary would have some authority to, 
to attempt to address this issue. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, you know, I realize that neither of you are, are USDA employees or authorized to speak for them, but what, what's your, what do you anticipate for time frame here as to when we'll know the final rules and when uh, FSA will hang, hang out the shingle and say, yeah, come on in and enroll? Well, we're, we're not completely clueless, but we, we sure can't give a date. Uh, the Act, as uh, John showed on uh, one of the last slides, says uh, this program should be implemented September 1st. Not entirely clear what it means to be implemented, but that sounds like an important date. Uh, in uh, in uh, testifying before the Senate and House Ag Committees and in just public comments, uh, the Secretary had said, we're going to be ready to go in September. In his announcement of the award that uh, we received to, to do this decision tool, uh, there was a, a table that said uh, the margin protection plan will be ready to go by the end of summer. Well, if, if he meant that in the literal calendar sense, uh, the last day of summer is the 21st of September. So I think it says the rule is going to be issued sometime in September maybe early, maybe mid-September. It's even conceivable it could be released the end of August if, um, you know, they're ready. So somewhere in that, you know, kind of four-week, end of August, middle of September period, that's when I guess the rule is going to come out. I think the program sign-up will begin two weeks after the final rule is released. That's based on, on the Proposal, the request for proposals that USDA issued to us in which they said, you got to be ready with your tool 15 days after we release the rules. That's not a contract, but it's an indication. Then the big question is going to be, how much time do you have sign, to sign up? And uh, I'm going to be pushing for USDA to be generous on that enrollment period for two reasons. One, there isn't going to be any payments under this program before 2015 anyway, unless, you know, a meteor strikes the planet. So <laughs> there's nothing to lose. And secondly, I think people need time to think this through. And it's going to come at harvest time. I don't care what state you live in. You're going to be harvesting something somewhere in September and October. And so I'm going to be pushing for a, for a long enrollment period. Uh, that doesn't mean <laughs> that will happen. But uh, those are the big parameters then and how I see I'll add that if you're thinking about MPP and, and decide that that's the risk management instrument you want to use, uh, the sign up at $4 coverage requires only the $100 administrative fee. So enrolling in the program uh, at that level, and then you'd still have the opportunity to adjust your coverage uh, during future calendar year decision periods. Uh, and so it gives you an opportunity to get in the program, and then you still have time to really figure it out and how it could work for your operation. Uh, but if you fail to enroll during the sign-up period and there's no opportunity to enroll at a later date, uh, you could miss out on the opportunity to participate in the safety net program. John, a question for you. Uh, so uh, let me just create a scenario. Uh, a dairy producer who has very low cost of production, they're very competitive, uh, they've got very strong liquidity on their balance sheet, so they're not uh, worried about uh, how they're going to pay the bills uh, the, the next time the margin goes, uh, goes south, and they've got strong equity on their balance sheet, so they're, they're just financially very solid and they operate very competitively. Is their best strategy to not do any of the above and just ride out the market? Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, this program uh, can work for uh, a number of operations. It's very easy to use. Uh, so I, I think you, you just really need to sit down and look at the opportunities available uh, under this program. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, there's, regardless of whether you use this program or you use the traditional uh, futures or you use the, um, uh, the other program, uh, there's going to be a net cost to it, correct? Uh, sure. 
and, and some of it really depends on when the sign up will be. Uh, if you can sign up very close to the coverage date, you'll have more market information. Uh, and you, the markets may indicate that uh, there's an imminent payment to be made from this program. Uh, so you could either be on the outside looking in or you could be one of the ones receiving an indemnity check. And I think you know, that's an important consideration to think about. Jim, if, uh, I, might, if I might add, uh, you know, you've described a situation for a business that doesn't have much risk. And uh, you know, that is absolutely the kind of conversation every farmer should have and be thinking about. But as John just said, I think there are producers who are going to take a look at this program not with risk management eyes, but with speculative eyes. Can I make money on this program whether I need it or not? I am not advising folks to do that, but I think that's a reality. So Andy, here's the question for you. Uh, you know, I, I realize that there's a, a lot of the game to be played here yet, uh, but from a macro standpoint, how do you suppose the MPP program is going to impact uh, dairy markets as we go forward? Is it going to change uh, behavior and price patterns? Certainly John uh, did a nice job of hedging uh, his analysis saying that, you know, if you have a program like this in place, it's going to uh, change market behavior. So what's your, you know, your kind of blue sky analysis on what this might do uh, in the life of the farm bill uh, in terms of market behavior? Well, I think there's two fundamentals here. One is dairy farmers make business and production decisions based on their total returns. And while every one of them would rather get their money out of the marketplace than give it out of the, get it out of the government, at the end of the day, in terms of a management or, or a business decision, uh, it probably doesn't matter that much. Uh, it, it's the stress in a, in a downside cycle that forces farmers to make uh, reductions. And if you don't have that stress because of a government check, well, there you go. Uh, the, that market signal is kind of abated. That's a fundamental. Uh, but the second part moderates that, and that is that it depends on how many people sign up. We could have well asked exactly this question about LGM dairy. Gosh, do you think this will have long-term market effects? And my answer was, and still is, gosh, no, because nobody uses it, so it doesn't really matter. If we ask the question about MILC, would it matter if uh, during down periods in milk prices, farmers got a fairly sizable check, I would say, yes, the MILC mattered. And to a certain degree, it prolonged low price periods because it took the supply adjustment part of the equation kind of off the table or changed it. I think MPP has the potential to do the same thing. If the sign-up is big and it removes that stress, which you know is kind of the whole point, uh, then you've just sort of uh, hamstrung the market mechanism on the supply side. Uh, it means that the market will adjust, but much more slowly. Uh, we've actually done some research on this, and uh, Chuck Nicholson in, in, uh, in particular, and uh, we have certainly seen scenarios where government payments could be very, very large in total, and we could create prolonged periods of fairly low prices. Uh, net revenue for farmers would not be bad, but market prices would be lower and the government would be picking up some more of that slack. So that possibility exists. Okay, another question. Uh, could you clarify the five-year or annual participation decision? Uh, sure. Yeah, that one is... Okay. Oh, go ahead, John. That's fine. Do it. Oh, okay. Uh, so my thought is that if it's if it's a five-year decision, you would enroll in MPP once, but have the annual option to then change your coverage levels uh, each year. Whereas if it's an annual decision, you could decide whether or not to participate or not participate uh, during each calendar year. So that would be the difference. The only place where, it, the only thing that really makes a difference is uh, under the five-year commitment, you can't participate in LGM dairy during that five years. 
if it's an annual commitment, then you could switch back and forth if you wanted to. But other than uh, excluding you from LGM Dairy, it really wouldn't matter much. And, and even if it is an annual decision, switching back and forth between uh, LGM Dairy and MPP would be very difficult because LGM Dairy allows you to buy coverage up to 10 months ahead of time. So if you're buying LGM coverage uh, in September and you, you buy coverage into the next calendar year, would that then prevent you from signing up for MPP that next calendar year? Now that's an important uh, question and I don't think we have the answer to that yet. Okay, I'm going to uh, wrap the seminar up here in the next couple of moments, uh, next couple of minutes, but uh, I'd like to have each of our speakers think about kind of a short wrap-up uh, comment, something that they'd like to uh, kind of add emphasis to, re revisit to uh, uh, wrap us up for today. While you're thinking of your uh, answers, I'm going to answer uh, a question that John raised, and I think the question was, you know, how will, you know, what will your lender require you to uh, do in terms of this program? So I'm going to answer that question on behalf of Farm Credit East. Obviously, I can't answer it for uh, other lenders, although I think other farm credit lenders in, in our nation would, would see it similarly to how I answer it. But it is a, a discussion point with your uh, specific lender. From the Farm Credit East standpoint, uh, we don't get involved in managing your business, making management decisions for you, and, and risk management uh, is no different. Uh, now, we might uh, advise certain uh, borrowers that uh, because of their financial situation, they need a good risk management strategy. Uh, that's not uncommon uh, in the conditioning of some of our loans. Uh, but we are not going to get involved in telling you uh, basically how to fill out uh, John's dashboard. That's something for you and your business advisors to uh, figure out and, and come up with the best plan uh, for you. So uh, in terms of uh, Farm Credit East, uh, who, who I suspect is the preponderance of the attendance today, uh, we would not get involved in making those specific decisions from a lending uh, side would add to that that uh, our consultants will be working with clients as they already do on uh, developing risk management uh, strategies. And so from that standpoint, we, we might participate as an advisor, but certainly not as a uh, dictator of what your um, uh, milk margin uh, decision uh, might, might be. So a little, little clarification there. Uh, John, thank you so much. Uh, you've done a great job and uh, uh, really impressed with your, uh, your dashboards and your analysis and so forth. Uh, a lot of food for thought there. And obviously, uh, it looks like you're well set with the, with the tools here to, to uh, plug in the final USDA uh, parameters. And, and producers will have a very nice tool to operate with. So we uh, really appreciate your work in this area. Do you have a final comment? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks again for having me. And my final comment would be that this is just a new risk management instrument to add to the existing portfolio of tools available. And so every dairy farmer is going to need to sit down and think about how all of these tools can best be integrated to, to help manage risk. And so with any questions anyone has, I, I can be reached at my Illinois email address. I'd be more than happy to, to talk uh, additionally about any of these topics. Thanks for that. And I, I suspect that we will be uh, scheduling another webinar uh, shortly after USDA announces the uh, rules in, in the fall, both for uh, those of us who uh, uh, might be slow learners on this, but uh, also for those who uh, haven't uh, had the opportunity to participate today. So uh, more to follow on that. Andy, uh, nice job as well. We really appreciate your leadership. We know uh, you were involved in a lot of the discussion uh, in, the, in the backdrop to the Farm Bill uh, process uh, over the last couple of years and uh, respected uh, kind of uh, analyst and pundit in, in our industry and uh, a lot of good insight as to the, as to the bigger context this morning. A wrap-up comment, please. 
Uh, three quick observations. One, uh, don't wait to the last minute. If you're a producer, don't wait. If you're dealing with producers, working with producers, encourage them not to wait. As John's uh, presentation probably made pretty clear, yeah, at one level, you know, okay, 550, 75%, I'm all done. It, you can simplify it, but gosh, there's, there's going to be moving parts here, and it's a big decision. Don't wait to the last minute, even though it's a busy time of year. Number two, information is the key. Uh, you need to be sure you know what you're looking at. You need to be sure you know the rules. The guy that picks up your milk doesn't know all the answers. Be sure you get them maybe more than once from people you trust. Number three, uh, uh, we're kind of <laughs> reluctant to get too far ahead of the horse on this, but uh, cooperative extension, uh, farm bureaus, cooperatives, farm credit, uh, are, are folks that are thinking about how we can do educational programs. Uh, in, in Cornell Cooperative Extension, we're starting to have conversations about what we might do. I've reached out to my colleagues in New England. I have con I've made, uh, I've had actually had quite extensive conversations with folks from Harrisburg. Uh, I'm hoping with uh, Jim Putnam and other folks at Farm Credit to coordinate well, work they're going to do. I'm going to be traveling to Albany in a couple of weeks to visit with the commissioner in New York Farm Bureau to think about how we can coordinate programs. So uh, we're going to do our best to provide the best possible information uh, to producers as we can, not only in New York but throughout the Northeast. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you both gentlemen. Uh, great information this morning uh, and uh, lots, lots of uh, food for thought here and uh, great tools for taking kind of a holistic uh, approach to uh, dairy uh, margin risk management. So um, uh, nice, nicely done. I want to uh, thank everybody for participating today. I turn over the microphone to Chris Lawton, our Director of Knowledge Exchange, for a brief commercial uh, as to an upcoming webinar. Sure, thanks, Jim. Um, for those of you on the in the audience that are growing cash field crops, things like corn, soybeans, and wheat, um, the Farm Bill programs continue. Um, there will be an important decision coming up as to whether to enroll in agricultural risk coverage, or ARC, or price loss coverage, or PLC. Um, and that decision is a, will be an important one. Uh, we will be having a webinar next week, June 18th, Wednesday, um, 10, 10 o'clock to 11.30 a.m. with Art Barnaby from Kansas State University. And we'll look at the farm build programs for um, cash field crops. So um, be sure to tune into that if you're um, falling into that category. And we are